I'm Bob Reeves and we want to show you how to build a good sharpening system for $2.89. This is a series of slides uh, that we took while I was building a, a system for a friend and uh, we did this uh, the way because it's easier uh, than taking movies over a period of three or four or five days. And so what you're seeing is a result of uh, a system that I built for a friend. This video is about making a good sharpening system at a very cheap price. And it stems from the need expressed by uh, several of the woodworkers that $100 or $200 investment in a factory built system is out of reach. Uh, perhaps that's because it's uh, seldom used and just, they just don't think it's uh, uh, needed all that badly. But we all want and need uh, sharp tools and we struggle with the way, uh, doing it the way we've always done it or the best way we can uh, doing with what we have. So let's adjust that kind of thinking uh, by showing uh, a much better way uh, that is within easy reach. This video attempts to show uh, how to, to make a, get good control of your sharpening process without breaking the bank. Despite the slow cost, the system proposed here is very adequate for uh, most of our needs. Along the way, you're going to need to do a small amount of metal work, but you shouldn't be intimidated by that requirement. If you don't feel comfortable in uh, doing it, uh, you might as well ask for someone uh, for help from someone who does. Just don't be discouraged by that small obstacle. Uh, when your sharpening system is done, you'll be glad you did uh, ask for help. By using a few hours of your time and a very few dollars, you can have a very worthwhile, meaningful, and effective sharpening system. Here's one of the kinds of sharpening jobs that we're out to do. Notice that the grinder marks go straight from the sharp edge all the way to the heel of the bevel, sort of like what we'd call a factory job. This quality of sharpening is just not possible without some way of controlling the angle in a very consistent and repeatable way. So controlling the sharpening process is what we want to accomplish. Notice this is just a straight edge that's flat uh, to, with a flat bevel. Uh, what about sharpening tools with curved edges? Here's a round nose scraper for the lathe. Again, the same controlled sharpening process is displayed. The marks go directly from the edge to the heel. But this is just another flat tool. What about tools that curve in all directions? Here's a wood turning gouge uh, showing the same controlled sharpening quality. The sharpening job is a, is a piece of cake using the system we propose here. If you want good control of your sharpening, stay with us. Control is what we're out to achieve. Here's uh, what many of us have to work with. It's an inexpensive grinder, perhaps made in China, and costing about $40 at a local flea market. This one is equipped, equipped with a 6 inch diameter fine grit wheel that's been abused, having rounded corners and a deep groove in its front face. The other spindle is equipped with a wire brush that is mostly worn out. These tool rests only adjust horizontally, not being capable of tilting in either direction. All of these are serious deficiencies in our system. This nameplate is damaged, but the speed uh, as it was and shows as 3600 RPMs. That's a little faster than I prefer, but we're going to live with what we have, since we can't change it without replacing the whole unit. Here's the system that we want to copy. It's called the Wolverine system. And this grinder runs at uh, 1800 RPM and is equipped with 8 inch coarse uh, grip soft wheels. These features are not what we're interested in. What we're working with is uh, what we have on hand. The f uh, these uh, features we want to copy are the tool rests. One of the tool rests is a large, flat, heavy steel plate uh, that's infinitely adjustable in two directions, that is, in and out and uh, uh, tilting. With, but uh, that's done without using any tools. These are the important features that are indispensable in achieving controlled sharpening. 
The other tool rest is a V-block attachment that's infinitely adjustable in the in and out direction. Another indispensable feature that we need to duplicate. Uh, both the tool rests are movable to either grinding wheel. That's another valuable feature. And speaking of copying, I don't think we should concern ourselves much about uh, copying a product that's uh, very likely patented uh, since we're only uh, talking about making a similar system uh, for our own individual use. We're not manufacturing this system to compete with any other business. So let's get going on the actual construction. Sort of like reading a recipe to cook something, let's gather the materials we need for this project. Incidentally, that $2.89 price that we mentioned in the title is a total fabrication. The materials shown in this video were all from the stuff in my shop, so there was no out-of-pocket cost. However, if you had to buy most of the material, it certainly wouldn't cost more than uh, $5. For the wooden parts, we need things you probably have around the shop anyway. We need a piece of three-quarter inch plywood that's a little over a foot by two feet, a piece of two, uh, one by four, about four feet long, and a short piece of two by four lumber. Some of the metal parts can uh, come from a junkyard or a local hardware store or wherever they sell such stuff. I prefer the junkyard because of the variety of materials available and the cheap price. You'll need a piece of quarter inch steel about three inches by four inches. It could be a little thicker but no thinner. It could be a little bigger but not much. I found this piece and it was exactly what we needed. You need a couple of strips of aluminum, a quarter inch thick by three quarter inch wide by about five inches long. Aluminum is preferred because it's easier to work with, uh, but steel is perfectly okay. In my stuff, I found this plate of quarter inch aluminum that will do just fine. You'll need a couple of pieces of sheet metal about uh, four and a half inches wide by six inches long. And these pieces are from scraps of galvanized roofing but metal from a, a coffee can or almost any sheet metal that you have will do. Now let's turn our attention to some items we need to purchase at a local hardware store. Depending on what quantities you have to buy, the cost will vary somewhat, but we're still in the cheap category. You'll need a short piece of quarter about 20 threaded rod about two inches long. Incidentally, Throughout this video, all the bolts, nuts, and the cetera that we use will be quarter 20 thread. It just makes things simpler to have only one size of bolts in a project. You need just a few uh, nuts and washers, and nothing special, just what you have. You're going to need a few uh, carriage bolts, or quarter 20 carriage bolts, some of them 2 inches long and some of them 3 inches long. You'll need a few or a couple of T-nuts. Uh, we show several here, but you'll only need two. Uh, the kind that with the drive-in teeth on their flanges are better than those that have burrs on their stem portions. This project requires two quarter 20 coupling nuts. If you're not familiar with them, they're those long nuts for connecting one bolt to another. These are really uh, readily available at most hardware stores. An assortment of uh, flathead wood screws is going to be needed. I prefer drywall screws as, as we show here. And you'll only need two lengths, uh, inch and a quarter and inch and five eighths. The last piece of uh, material that we need is a short piece of eighth inch uh, steel rod. We could use a nail or a heavy piece of wire, but it just needs to be fairly stiff. Remove those rinky-dink tool rests from the grinder and get rid of them. Remove the uh, side guards fr from both wheels, but be sure to save all those fasteners that, that s secure them in place. These will be reused later. You need to measure and record the motor base uh, dimensions in the front to back directions. Here we have about five and a half inches. Also, you need to measure and record the wheel to wheel center line distance. Here we have 11 and a half inches. 
remove the old wheels and put them aside. Yours may be okay for use later, but we'll discuss the, the uh, wheel specifications at the proper time. Uh, run the motor and with some emery cloth clean up the spindle in preparation for the new wheels. Replace the wheel flanges and nuts loosely on the spindles uh, so they don't get misplaced and then place the grinder aside for now. Make a base for the whole unit from 3 quarter inch plywood. Uh, the front to back dimension should be at least twice what the motor base dimension that we recorded earlier and the length should be at least 6 inches longer than the wheel spacing. Here our base is 12 inches by 18 inches. Lay out the uh, plywood base marking its center line in both directions so you have a good center point. Uh, in our case the motor base has two mounting holes along its center line so on, on your base uh, locate and mark the hole locations so the motor is centered on the plywood. Drill quarter inch holes through the plywood to match the motor base. Install uh, carriage bolts at each uh, mounting hole. As we show here, the holes are counterboard so the base uh, would set flat on the bench top. But because of an oversight, that proved to be an unnecessary step and we'll cover that later. Turn the base right side up and set the motor over its bolts. But uh, don't put the nuts on yet. This just verifies that the motor base uh, fits the bolt pattern. After you verify that, put the motor aside for a while. Uh, however, it's a good idea to draw around the motor base while it's still in place. Going back to that uh, center point of the plywood base, lay out the center line of the, of the wheels matching the dimension recorded earlier. A compass is the uh, good tool to get the center location and using a square then draw the uh, line across the plywood base, base at each grinding wheel center line. Using a, a good compass with its points uh, set at three quarters of an inch apart, mark the points of the uh, longs, uh, on the long center line at points an inch and a half apart so that they're each side of the uh, center line, the wheel center line. These points identify the edges of each side of the main element of our new system. Now with your square draw a line across the base at each of the, of the four points. Oops, I please excuse this dummy for failing to mention the fact that we should have sawed that one by four board that's four feet long. We should have ripped it into inch and a half wide strips for use throughout the project. Again, using single dimensions is a real good practice. Here's what our geometric construction should like, look like at this point. From the uh, inch and a half wide strips that we just made, saw off a couple of pieces five inches long and lay them alongside the inner lines of the uh, last slide. In our case, they were a little bit too wide, so we had to modify them to ma uh, a little to clear the motor base. Drill and countersink two holes in each piece about an inch in from each end. Uh, the hole must be larger than the major diameter of the screws and the countersink must be deep enough to allow the heads to be below flush. Once again, I got the cart ahead of the horse, so you should place those strips uh, uh, along the inner lines and, and screw them in place um, and be sure to mark them so they can be removed and put back in the exact same location. Then apply some glue to each piece and screw it back in place. Be sure to clean up all the squeezed out glue. Put the grinder back in place just to verify that everything fits. Adjust everything as necessary and then remove the grinder and put it uh, aside for now. From those remaining inch and a half wide strips, saw off two pieces. One piece needs to be as long as the width of the plywood base, in our case 12 inches and the other piece needs to be longer, perhaps as much as 24 inches. Ours is 18 inches and it seems a little short for some jobs. But save those other little cutoff pieces for later use. 
from those uh, pieces that we saved that we just cut off, saw a couple of pieces five inches long. Also, at this stage, we need uh, to start the metal work uh, by having two strips of quarter inch aluminum about five inches long and just a little narrower than the thickness of the wooden strips that we just made. In our case, these were sawn from sal uh, a salvaged piece of scrap and sanded to width on the belt sander. It's important that they be at least a 30 second narrower than the thickness of the wood. At the middle of one edge of both the five, six, uh, five inch wide uh, strips, drill a 5 16 hole through and counter bore it with a uh, 3 quarter inch diameter about a 16 deep. Now that cut off, uh, that counter bore could be made with by hand or with a radial arm saw, some other means, but uh, you need to have that uh, down below the surface. So we need to install a T-nut in each of those uh, countersunk holes. Near one end of each of the aluminum strips, drill and countersink a hole for a flathead screw, but it must be below flush. The clearance hole must be sloppy enough to allow the plate to move around freely. Also, on the flat side of each of the wooden strips, at the approximate center line, drill and countersink two screw holes about an inch in from each end. Again, be sure that the countersinks are below flush. Also, the countersinks must be on opposite sides of each other because one's for the left side and one's for the right side. Round off the end of each of the aluminum pieces at the screw end and install them over the nuts as shown. Temporarily assemble the main bar element in its place. We're using a, a cardboard shim to ensure that we have some clearance. And place the wooden and aluminum assembly opposite the fixed element. Mark uh, for easy assemble uh, for location and screw it down. Remove the screws, apply glue, and re-screw it in the, to its permanent home. Just be sure that the cardboard shim is in place and everything seems to be lined up right. Clean up the squeezed out glue, being sure that the aluminum strips are free to float around. This is how the whole thing uh, should look at this point. Here's a close up look at one of the more important features of this system that bar clamping uh, system that we just made. With that grinder set back in place, things are beginning to take shape. In order to adjust and hold these main elements where they must go, though, uh, we need a means of clamping them. That was our reason for uh, having the T-nuts and aluminum strips. So let's make some knobs now to enable uh, doing without any tools. Start the uh, knob making process in the usual manner by making a two and a half inch square uh, from the uh, short piece of two before we have. Draw diagonal lines to identify the center point. At the center point of each of the holes or each of the blocks, uh, drill an inch or a quarter inch hole through and counterboard a half inch deep. You could get by without uh, the counterbore but if you want to use a longer bolt, but I prefer to do it this way. Install a carriage bolt in each hole that extends through the block at least by two inches. Install a nut and a washer on each and pull them up tight. At the lathe, chuck on the bolt and turn a two inch diameter knob that feels good in your hand. If you're not very good on the lathe, you could manage to by just sawing out a round knob on the bandsaw. The object is to provide a handle for the bolt uh, to be used to, to clamp that main bar. Screw the knob into the clamping mechanism to assure uh, uh, good and effective clamping of the main crossbar. Here we discovered two small problems. The first was that the edge of the original plywood base interfered and it wouldn't let the knob go all the way in. The second was that the knob was too close to the workbench, so it made it impossible to tighten easily.
the first fix was that we sawed off the plywood base to where it was just flush with that clamping mechanism. The other fix was to, to nail a couple of uh, riser strips uh, on the bottom to allow finger room for the knob. Now we're all clear, but the clamping mechanism needs a cover to keep grit and crap out of it. So let's make sheet metal cover uh, that looks neat and doesn't interfere with anything. Begin by cutting two pieces of sheet metal a little narrower than the clamping me mechanism and two inches longer than the mechanism. The extra length is necessary because we want to fold it over to create some clearance that allows the bar to slide in and out. We could manage by putting thin shims between them, but the method is uh, good and effective. In our case, the sheet metal is about four and three quarters wide uh, by six and a half inches long and about a thirty second thick. Begin that folding over process by marking the bend lines where the ends of the finished cover will be. Here we're an inch in and from each end and four and a half inches apart. Place that piece of metal in the vise that has sharp cornered jaws at the, and at the bend line and with a hammer and a block of scrap wood form a sharp corner around the vise jaw. The first phase of bending is complete when the metal has a 90 degree turn up. So the, uh, do the same thing at the other end, uh, being careful to do it on the same side as the opposite end. Lay the sheet metal on the bench top and complete those folds uh, with a block of scrap wood and a hammer. Center punch the location of a series of staggered pattern holes to hold the cover in place and drill with a sixteenth uh, inch drill at each punch mark. With uh, small nails, install those uh, cover plates, uh, checking each main bar to be sure it will slide freely and the clamps are, are securely adjusted as, as required. You might even want to interchange the bars to make sure that they will work on either location. Here's what our new system should look like at this stage. Everything seems to be going just like we planned it. Our next task is to make a V-block that enables a repeatable sharpening of tools that have handles on one end and cutting edge on the other end. Now we begin this by using a block of wood from our 2 before. Cut uh, blocks uh, 2 inches wide by 2 inches long and then tilt your table saw to 45 degrees and with the fence about a quarter of an inch from the blade Gradually raise the blade and make trial cuts from end to end. Make sure that the V runs uh, across the grain rather than along it to keep from splitting. Here's what we're after in terms of the new V block. Drill and countersink a couple of screw holes in the long strip that will fasten the V block to it. Glue the, and uh, clamp the, the, to the bar permanently using screws as our clamp. Make an end cap for that V block out of quarter inch stock uh, about two inches wide and three and a half inches long. Uh, glue and clamp it to the uh, V block flush with the bottom of the long bar and flush at each side. Clamp it, uh, the V block and, and uh, end cap in place and clean up any squeezed out glue and put it aside until the glue is cured. Here's what our V-block attachment should look like at this stage. This attachment is complete at this stage too. Now we're ready to start on the other uh, swiveling tool rest and we need to confirm the grinding wheel location relative to the main crossbar. Here it appears that the wheel center line coincides with the center line of the tool rest. Therefore the swivel block needs to be centered on the tool rest plate. Now it's necessary to do some more metal work. This time we need to make the adjustable tool rest plate which really is the heart of the system. The quarter inch thick steel plate should be about three inches by four inches. Uh, paint it with some kind of fast drying paint and after the paint dries lay out and center punch a couple of holes to fasten it to the swivel block. They should be located each side of the horizontal center line of the plate. 
Here's what our layout work uh, should look like and it's ready for the drill press. Drill 1364 holes through the plate and tap them with a quarter 20 tap, applying a little oil to the tap and to each hole. Uh, here we hold the tap in the drill press chuck to assure that the threads are square with the plate. However, the power for the tapping was supplied by hand. Just turn in the spindle uh, with your hand. It's a sure way of having a good job uh, and it's square with the plate. Uh, you may choose to use an ordinary tap wrench, which is okay. For that pivot block uh, that attaches to the bottom of the adjustable uh, tool rest, we need an inch and a half square piece. Lay out one side that's a long grain, not on its end, for two holes, three quarters of an inch apart and at its center line. On one of the flat sides of the piece, lay out one hole location at its center point. At the two hole locations in the edge, drill 17 64 hole uh, through the inch and a half piece. Uh, this is to make clearance for the bolts that are going to go through later. At the center point of the side, uh, drill a 17 64 hole through the piece. With two inch long hex head bolts and, and washers, bolt the block uh, to the bottom side of the plate and draw them up firmly. With that assembly in the vise, hacksaw off the tips of the protruding bolts. Then at the belt sander, flatten and smooth that tool rest and we're almost done with the metal work, so hang on just a little longer. For our next step, we need to know the center line height of the motor shaft. So we set the motor uh, on the workbench, not on the base, but set on the workbench and measure it as accurately as you can. Here we have 5 and 3 sixteenths. This is important because we want the top of the surface of, the, of that adjustable tool rest to be on the wheel center line when it's in the flat and horizontal condition. We need to make an upright piece to connect the main bar to the tool rest. Saw a piece of the inch and a half strip to a length that matches the center line height minus the thickness of the top plate of the tool rest. So in our case it's 5 and 3 sixteenths minus a quarter inch or 4 and 15 sixteenths. In order for the plate to swivel, we need to round its top end. So here we laid out a semicircle at the center of one end. We need to drill a quarter inch hole at the center of that semicircle. At the bandsaw, cut that semicircle and sand it on the belt sander. Install a uh, two inch carriage bolt into that hole. Assemble the, uh, that upright piece to the tool rest assembly to confirm that it will swivel freely and just make whatever adjustments are necessary to, to make that happen. Now for the last little bit of metal work, we need to make a nut to hold that tool rest plate at any angle we set it. For this we use a couple of, of coupling nuts uh, and one regular nut. The screw the regular nut about two inches onto a threaded rod and follow that by the two coupling nuts. However, the last coupling nut only threads on about five sixteenths and leaving a cavity or room to uh, uh, assemble the against that upright piece. Now we carefully uh, maintain that uh, cavity and thread the coupling nut uh, and the regular nut together and jam them up uh, to make one long assembly. Hacksaw that threaded rod uh, flush with the regular nut, sand it smooth or file it smooth and get ready for a last little bit of uh, metal working. At one of the flat, flats on the regular nut we need to drill a small hole into which the cross handle, that little eighth inch rod, uh, will be installed. Incidentally, that rod could be made out of a nail of appropriate size, but you want to drill the hole a little undersize at first and then ream it uh, without taking it out of the vise to the final diameter. And that final diameter should be exactly the same diameter as the little rod or handle. Drive the cross handle through the nut assembly. If it's a little loose, the rod can be swelled at its midsection by placing it on a hard surface and painting it with a hammer. With the washer over the bolt, 
uh, put that nut onto the tool rest assembly and verify that it will tighten. You might have to make some adjustment, uh, but just be sure that the swivel, the tool rest swivels easily around the bolt. Disassemble the tool rest from the upright piece and drill and countersink two holes that will connect the, it to the main uh, cross element. After a dry assembly with the screws, apply uh, some glue and screw it to the upright uh, main element. Here we use longer screws to maximize the strength of the assembly. This next step is purely optional, however a coat of fast drying paint uh, gives a uniform finished appearance to the whole project. We just use cheap black paint to cover it all up. The small parts are painted and hung out to dry. After reassembly, we're almost done with this project except we still need uh, grinding wheels to use it. As we said at the beginning, the fine grit grinding wheel that was on it and the wire brush that were there uh, were not acceptable for our purpose. Uh, fine uh, grit wheels lead to overheating that ruins tool steel while the wire brush won't sharpen anything. So we're in the market for new grinding wheels, but that's an additional cost that's not chargeable to the sharpening system project. We'd like to have a coarse wheel that's soft. A catalog search uh, offered uh, exactly what we wanted, but the cost was about $25 a piece plus shipping. Uh, which we considered uh, to be too much. The local hardware store offered these wheels for $10 each. So guess what decision was made? Remember the coarser the wheel the better it is uh, for cutting uh, cooler and minimizing the tool burning. This label shows that th these wheels are for mild steel indicating a rather hard bonding agent is used. Ideally uh, a softer wheel uh, allows some of the grit to break away uh, from itself while it's being used so loading and gla uh, glazing does not occur. That minimizes overheating too, but we're going to be satisfied with what we uh, have here, second best. Install those wheels one at a time so they can each be dressed to a truly round condition before turning, but before we, we turn that grinder on, let's talk a little bit about safety. Don't even think of starting the wheel, a uh, new wheel, until the side guard is securely installed. Then don't stand in front of the, the machine to start it. Stand to one side, reach around the unit and flip the switch and allow that wheel to run for at least two minutes uh, to be sure that it wasn't cracked in handling. And before we dress any grinding wheel, uh, put on a face, full face shield even if you wear glasses and think they will protect your eyes. Remember, the dressing process breaks away grit from the uh, flying wheel and uh, it will uh, make pits in your glasses. So don't take a chance on having a bad day. So let's get on with dressing the new wheels. Dressing a grinding wheel is the process of, of cutting away some of the uh, surfaces, the particles on the surface of the wheel and renewing its cutting capability. For this job I prefer a single point diamond. Here we have a homemade unit that works but it's not the greatest. However, it does a job of removing uh, any out of round condition that shakes and vibrates the grinder and lets the wheel run smoothly and cut freely. You may not have access to a diamond tool so let's look at other ways. The next best dresser commonly available is, is what I call a star wheel uh, tool that actually crush rolls the wheel surface and refreshes its cutting action. It's good, but can allow some out of round condition to persist. The last and least preferred dressing method is the emery stick that just rubs against the wheel. Being harder than the wheel, it dislodges some particles, but is prone to making the wheel surface to be too smooth and too dull for free cutting of the tool steel. This uh, smooth and slick surface may cause overheating. However, it does have the advantage of doing a, a better job of removing any out of round condition. So if I were on a tight budget, I'd choose an emery stick for rounding up the wheel and a star wheel dresser to uh, provide a good sharp open cutting surface. 
with the wheels freshly dressed, we're ready to put the system to work. But stop and think about it. The system we built is, is very adequate for sharpening most woodworking tools. However, it should be dedicated to the tool sharpening process only. Don't even think of using it for shar uh, to sharpen lawnmower blades or anything that might round over the corners or destroy the wheels. So let's reserve this system for sharpening woodworking tools and supporting our expensive habits. Thank you. Mm -hmm.